Hello everyone and thanks for attending this talk. Let me start with a question. How many programming leads did you have in your career? Two, five, fifty? Roughly one or two by project, I would assume. If I remember correctly, so far I've had 15 programming leads and I've worked closely with at least twice as many. That's quite a lot. But do you know what they had in common? They were all managing programmers in their own way. Some were very hands-on and led the management side to the production team. On the other hand, others didn't code at all, but dedicated their efforts to their team's well-being and efficiency. The mothers, some others were more into the high level and the publisher relationship, for instance, while letting senior drive the code. Do you think we have so few talks about programmers and programming leads because everyone is different? I really wonder. But don't get me wrong. Of course, technology and innovation are essential, crucial even. But in our highly competitive industry, hiring, growing and retaining programmers is a significant concern for any studio. But if you ask me, I think it's a fascinating topic. Quickly about me, I started as a gameplay programmer at Ubisoft 16 years ago. I worked on franchises like the Raving Rabbids, Far Cry and Watch Dogs then at Behavior Interactive on Star Citizen and many other games on different leadership positions. Now I'm a project tech lead on Project Dagger at People Can Fly Montreal, and my take today is to support both programmers and leads. I also recently joined Rainbow Unicorn Games as an investor and a promising indie studio as an advisory board member. As you can imagine, I love this industry, and it's in big part thanks to the programmers and the leads I've met on the way. These leads inspired me, and I've always wanted to be one of them, but for the wrong reasons. I thought I would gain more recognition and be able to control and decide. Then, while gaining more experience, I still wanted to become a lead, but my interest shifted to my peers and how I could help them instead. And now, as a lead myself, I think my best contribution is to support people in their growth and make sure they work together efficiently. But this part is not always easy, especially now, in a work from home context, with people in several time zones, we lack the office to forge casual bonds with others. And by bonds, I don't even mean friendships, but just the simple connection, the trust to unlock someone's potential. Leads have a very complex role in this new context, probably more than before and they should support their team even more. So, what can a lead do to make sure that programmers build the necessary bond to work efficiently? At the risk of surprising you, it starts with the lead. So if you're an aspiring lead, an accomplished lead, or a technical director, you must do your part. First, lead by example. As a leader, you are the representative of your team. It means that you carry your values as well as theirs. And sometimes you have to make these values more visible than usual to convey their importance. For example, suppose you identify your team needs to develop their transparency. In that case, you'll have to demonstrate how you make sure that any trusted communication is properly flowing vertically and that you are transparent yourself. Then of course, everyone should understand the benefits of these values. Benefits can be added trust, improved speed, or anything else. To close on this topic, make sure your behavior matches your integrity and the value you stand for. Otherwise, people could perceive it as playing politics or having a hidden agenda. Another point is to hold yourself accountable. Over time, you'll want to have your programmers responsible for what they deliver because it's a great way to improve ownership and thus productivity. But before that, you should take responsibility for results. All results, good and bad. You should probably use the good results to empower your team, but you should also show them that you can handle bad results with humility and responsibility. Finally, for the most challenging part of leading by example, give and extend trust to your team members. And I can see that as a young lead or even as a new lead in an established team, this may be hard and time consuming. 
I can guarantee that it's worthwhile. Trust is what will unlock genuine autonomy, ownership and effectiveness. If that's something you want to develop, a piece of advice would be to start with a propensity to trust and extend it as soon as you get more comfortable. You don't need to rush it, but make it meaningful. Trust in any social environment is a deep but fascinating topic, and I encourage you to read and learn more about it. Now that you're on the way to being a role model for your team, there's one more small thing to develop, yourself. Indeed, to support all your efforts, you must stay relevant. Let's consider three valuable fields in order of importance in my eyes. You don't need to become an expert in any of those, but you should be at least knowledgeable. The first domain is our industry and the competition. As you hopefully know, our industry moves fast these days, with new studios opening every week and acquisitions announced every month or so. And with the decline of some mainstream events, it's also harder to be aware of all the new announcements. My piece of advice would be to keep track of what's going on through your favorite medium, so you can better understand why people are leaving some studios or, or why there are a sudden attraction to others. This awareness will help in hiring decisions and retention strategies, but your team members will also see you as relevant in this domain and be more inclined to trust some of your high-level choices. The second field is regarding your management skills. It's unfortunate to see experienced managers getting overly comfortable and failing to improve. Our industry's dynamic and volatile nature will keep honing your adaptability, but think further. Read, watch, and learn from any resource you may enjoy. If you need a few buzzwords to start you off, look up empathy, imposter syndrome, and trust. That should set you on a long but very valuable journey. Growing your management skills will help you anchor what you do well naturally and develop practical tools to help you in many situations. And finally, the essential domain, the technical skills. Don't ever neglect them. You cannot afford to stop being relevant on the technical topics as a programming lead. Even if you trust your team to make the right decisions for the architecture, for instance, you need to feel it for yourself at least to understand what they are going through every day. The first way, which is the easiest and the least involved probably, is to participate in code review. If you find the right balance, it will become a great communication channel for your team, and you'll be part of it. The other way is, obviously, to code. I can already hear you saying that you spend most of your time in meetings and that context switching is a pain. And I feel you, I really do. But if you can afford it, try to pick small tasks that are not on the golden path. You don't want anyone relying on your summit while you're stuck in meetings. So instead, focus on quality of life improvements for your team and your project. Small tools, debug display improvements, or process automation, as you see fit. Before we move on to the next section, I want to talk about something dear to me and which I think is a crucial tool for it, one-on-ones. I know plenty of online resources talk about this topic, so I'll, I'll outline what I consider essential. In my mind, there are a few ways to make them wrong, but there are many ways to make them right. So make sure to adapt them to your and your team's needs. First, your one-on-ones must be predictable. Set them in a regular and constant frequency. People just know they can expect that specific spot available with you just for them. For the cadence itself, start with something you're comfortable with. For instance, I like to have them weekly in a remote environment. But you, you may want to set them less frequently, depending on your context and team size. Second, your one-on-one should be à la carte and tailored to your programmers. It means that you should adapt to your programmers' needs individually. You may then change the frequency, or the length, or both. Some people like to talk for an hour, while others prefer a more concise format. Also, adapt the content. There is a set of information that you should try to grasp overall, like your team's morale and their motivation. But let your programmers talk about what they feel like sharing. 
Some will mainly talk about casual topics and keep their work-related items for other communication channels, in contrast, others will maintain a list of subjects to discuss during this unique spot, so they don't bother you in private messages during the week. And both are great and acceptable, as anything in between. Every one-on-one -on -one is different because everyone is different. If you have to remember just one thing about one-on-ones, it would be to listen first. And I know it may not be easy sometimes, especially when you have good news to share. Still, as you manage to listen with empathy, you'll be able to adapt more accurately to their needs and create a better communication channel. And that will be helpful in the next section. All right, let's see what we got so far. We have more insight into what a lead should target for themselves, even if it takes time and effort. We also have a basic knowledge of a suitable means of communication between a lead and their team. So it's time we shift our focus slightly and see what a lead can or should do for their team. As you probably figured out from the intro, what I consider the most important is to foster a growth environment. I get genuinely proud to see people improving and evolving. I also think that promoting someone is not only an achievement for this person, but also for their lead and mentors. When people reach their expected potential and beyond, they ride yet within the team. Everything becomes more accessible and quicker. But what can a lead do to drive this? I think it starts with the healthy environment. We are in a creative industry with iterative processes, and we all know that failures will happen. Don't stigmatize these letdowns, but instead, spin them into learning experiences. Your team will be more inclined to release quick iterations then, so that everyone will see features getting in the game sooner, and everyone can iterate faster. So they will be, they will be also more likely to take risks, and we all know that risk leads to rewards. Then as a lead doing high and low level plannings, keep healthy buffers so that you don't end up doing crunch. For high level planning, consider the features risk and dependencies to evaluate the amount of additional time to allocate. For low level planning, be mindful of the iterations, the testing, especially in multiplayer, and the polish expectation. To get back on the crunch topic, one could argue that it can help bind the team together because it provides um, malicious sense of belonging. But that's not something I'm willing to push you today, as I think there are safer and healthier ways. On the opposite side, I advocate for planned breathing spaces in which programmers can get back to their code and refactor it with a minimum amount of pressure. In my project, we have such moments after every milestone. This way, the team can get a quick hack in for a delivery, knowing they'll get a chance to tackle it properly in a few weeks. I think it helps everyone get more trust in their code and the production process. And all the while, you're hacking at that dreaded monster the tech debt. If you have a direct communi communication channel with your programmers, one-on-one -on -one or similar, you should know their work preferences. Try to fulfill those whenever you can. It's not always possible, of course, but you can get a lot by achieving this programmer agency. It shows that you listen to them, and that's a very healthy basis for a new relationship. They are more motivated to work on these features, so quality and speed will improve for the implementation, but also the decision making. And as they get more accountable for these features, they'll get recognition and trust from their peers, turning it into even more motivation. As a programmer, ownership is a fundamental source of fulfillment. Extend your trust to your team by sharing ownership with them. Still in the agency category, but for the longer term, you should cater to your programmer's personal development and career goals. Regardless of their fields or assigned features, some may want to try new architectures, patterns, tools, or simply learn new things while doing their job. Try to incorporate these self goals in their periodic performance reviews, along with what your studio usually requires, they will thus get a chance to improve or acquire a unique skill set that they chose themselves. And I think it is a significantly undervalued growth channel. But thankfully, it 
can easily be implemented and monitored. As a side note, regularly check people's interests during one-on-ones, as they may change during the year. So make sure you're always up to date with everyone's goal. This final part of this section is all about providing and sustaining a cooperative environment. People must know they can rely on each other's skills, knowledge and availability, especially when working from home in different time zones. If you have the luxury of having your team close by, organize in-person events. If not, you can do many activities online to get people to know each other. But let's focus on those at least a minimum programming related. For example, you can set up game jams or hackathons. They require quite a bit of organization, but they are great for pushing creativity, which can be significant if your programmers feel the project constraints or scope limit them. There are also online escape games now. Some use pure logic less like most physical ones, but others also provide coding challenges. We tried one of them with my team and I highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. For work-related activities, organize group playtests on your game and competitors. One piece of advice would be to always have a focus feature in mind, so that you can retrieve valuable feedback at the same time, for the design team or any other. Once people get to know each other better, you should encourage them to share their experiences. And you must share yours as well, of course. It can be about a completed feature, or some tool someone used in the past, anything that could help raise the global quality or give general tech awareness or satisfy people's curiosity. These mini-talks are very, also very helpful to start discussions and engage your team even more. Then, do retrospectives regularly at a pace that suits your team. If people are comfortable talking, this will help everyone understand issues from another perspective and confront other realities. Keep track of what goes well and what should be improved for the future. Finally, the one thing that will bolster any successful collaboration is to achieve results together. For instance, Shipping a game is probably the most significant achievement that can create a tangible bond within a team. But before getting your game on the shelves, look for the smaller wins. A milestone, feature completion, a successful team debugging session, anything showcasing the work and collaboration of several people. And don't limit yourself to complimenting people in one-on-ones. Spread the message wider in your project, within your studio, or even on LinkedIn if you think it's worth sharing with the world. These successes will then act as keystones in your team's growth and the mutual trust they extend to each other. Forging bonds within a programmer's team will unlock more potential, create more opportunities and make everything seamless, if not faster. My final piece of advice is to be creative. The more you know your team and yourself, the more you'll be able to adapt your decisions and your actions. Then you will naturally find unique ways to make your programmers feel like a part of the same team. For instance, on my team, during one of our weekly tech meetings in which we usually share knowledge, we quickly run off of topics and I wanted to do something different than playtest for once. I know some of my programmers hate with a passion the runtime warnings we have in game, so I gave them a challenge. They had until the end of the meeting to find and fix as many in-game warnings as possible. It came out of nowhere, but it was a great success. Programmers enjoyed the harmless challenge and we got rid of pesky warnings. So be creative and keep trying new things to forge meaningful bonds. These changes may be a long and continuous process, and I admit that I'm barely at its beginning myself. But I can already see the benefits in my team. People do not hesitate to reach out and help each other in during milestones. They are not afraid to raise issues and proactively discuss solutions. And they have never worked together before. Most of us have not even met in person yet. So if you are a lead, I can only suggest you try to apply some or all of these principles principles while supporting your programmers in this process and seeing the benefits for your team. 
If you are a programmer, and this sounds relevant, work with your peers and please support your lead because we need everyone's effort to forge this bond. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. Thanks again.